everyone. Welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tehami. The tensions between the US and its other European allies and Russia are on the rise over the Ukraine uh, conflict. We have seen the escalation on the ground in the fighting, as well as the exchange of strong words between the two sides, especially when we talk about the US and uh, Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly said that the confrontation with the West is an existential threat or a battle for Russia and um, just before the first anniversary of the Russia and Ukraine conflict he also suspended one of the last major arms control treaties new star treaty with the US and uh, the US and NATO have repeatedly denied the uh, Russia's assertions and uh, we have seen at the same time US President uh, Joe Biden saying that a conflict between NATO and Russia could trigger a third world war. At the same time, uh, we have seen uh, that the US officials have also warned that China is contemplating to provide a lethal assistance to uh, Russia, especially vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine a conflict. Uh, but the Chinese officials have denied this and have said that it is uh, the Western countries, including the US and NATO, which is providing the military assistance to uh, Ukraine. Now we have seen a development that China has released a 12-page position paper on first anniversary of the Ukraine uh, conflict calling for ceasefire and talks mm -hmm. between the two sides. It has also opposed the threat or the use of the nuclear weapons. The NATO countries, however, have seen this particular 12-page uh, 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 position paper with uh, skepticism. And uh, we have seen that uh, Ukrainian president, however, on the other side, has uh, welcomed uh, this move by China, but uh, with uh, caution, as well as French president, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, has also welcomed this uh, particular move by uh, the uh, Chinese side. In today's program, we are going to understand that China's uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine conflict and what needs to be done to de-escalate uh, the situation over there and avoid a global catastrophe. And uh, for that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Professor Dr. Akab Malik. He's associated with Center for International Peace and Stability at NUST. Dr. Malik, thank you very much for your time yeah. for being with us. And uh, we are also honored to have been joined in the studio by Air Commodore, retired Basidur Raza Abbasi, senior analyst. Mr. Abbasi, thank you very much for your time, also for being with us on Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. On Skype at the same time, we are being joined from uh, Wiesbaden, Germany, by Ms. Helga Zepp LaRouche, founder and chairwoman, Schiller Institute. Uh, Ms. LaRouche, thank you very much for your time for being with us on Views on News tonight. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, let me uh, begin with you, Ms. LaRouche. Now, this 12-page position paper released by China calls for talks and ceasefire. We have seen it's been seen with skepticism uh, by the EU, by the NATO. Why is that so? Well, I think the people who want to ruin Russia, in quote, uh, uh, and that has been the explicit goal stated by you know various people, including the foreign minister of Germany, this uh, green uh, <coughs> Baerbock, uh, who has said repeatedly that they want to ruin Russia. Now, naturally, if you have that uh, mindset, um, then you don't welcome a peace proposal. And I think it's very important that uh, <coughs> Macron is uh, you know has expressed support, that Russia has uh, expressed support. But you know the Western uh, countries who are against it, they claim that you know this uh, gives too many privileges and too many uh, compromises to Russia. But I think it's a very important proposal, and the more countries from the global south give support to it, the better, because the more quickly the Western countries realize that they are not the majority of mankind, um, the better. So, uh, Ms. LaRouche, as we have seen different uh, sort of reaction coming from within 
the Euro uh, uh, European continent, uh, different uh, European countries reacting differently to this. As you, uh, you have already mentioned that uh, Mr. Emmanuel Macron has welcomed uh, this move. So as you deem it a uh, very significant um, a move by China, uh, which is aimed at uh, bringing peace and resolving the conflict through uh, talks. So do we understand there is lack of unanimity and consensus among the European allies when it comes to dealing with Ukraine conflict? Well, I think that the, the, Europe, Europe, the European Union has become a powder keg which could explode at any moment. You should not leave out of the picture that the revelations by Seymour Hirsch of the, about the authorship of who would sabotage the Nord Stream pipelines, that is not under the carpet. Uh, more and more mainstream media have reported about it. And uh, <clears throat> I think that once it sinks in more and more uh, people's mind that it could have been the United States uh, sabotaging the main natural gas supply for Germany, and with that causing the deindustrialization de of Germany, uh, and that Norway, as a NATO member, was complicit in it for their benefit because they can now sell their oil and gas uh, uh, more, more be better to, to Germany and the continent of Europe. I think this has such an erosive power that it could be the end of NATO. And I think uh, Seymour Hirsch has given a second interview uh, to a Canadian website where he said that he compares it to the uh, assassination of Archduke Ferdinand at the beginning of World War I. Uh, and I think if you think about it, uh, it is incidents like that which uh, could detonate uh, a situation which is already extremely tense. And uh, that is the condition of the EU and NATO. So I think I'm not surprised at all that you know such uh, difference uh, in views emerge. And you should not forget that you know there is a new phenomena, and that is that mass demonstrations for peace uh, are now spreading all over the place. There was a very important one on the 19th of February in Washington. Uh, which was not so large in numbers, but it was important in terms of the quality of people because it had a spectrum from right to left, everybody under one roof uh, protesting uh, the, the war. And just uh, this past weekend, there was a wonderful demonstration in uh, Berlin. 50,000 people uh, were peacefully demonstrating and it was celebrated, in my view, correctly as the beginning of a new uh, peace movement, uh, which is intending to grow and uh, become so strong that it will change the policy of the government. You also had a demonstration of 20,000 the week before at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, you had in Genoa and Italy uh, and Rome, uh, you had demonstrations against the war, uh, 20,000 people in Genoa. Uh, where people were protesting against the delivery of weapons to Ukraine. So I think this is catching on, and uh, it just reflects that both the global south, who does not want to support this war or does not want to take sides in, in the war, and a growing peace movement in the NATO countries itself. They are, they are united in spirit by the same aim to maintain peace at a moment where world peace is in absolutely serious danger. Uh, right, uh, Ms. LaRouche, um, uh, very comprehensively, very pertinently, you have elaborated and uh, you have shed light on what uh, actually is happening uh, over there in, uh, in the European continent, what actually people feel about this Ukraine conflict. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, let me proceed with the discussion. Uh, uh, Dr. Malik, now this particular release of 12-page position paper by China, how significant it is and why do you think the Europeans are skeptic about it? <coughs> I think that uh, primarily... Um, European Union and the countries in there, uh, members of NATO, including the United States and Canada and other countries, um, believe that China supports uh, Russia, primarily because it's abstained four votes already in the UN General Assembly, uh, opposing um, um, the war, for example. Um, and, I, uh, and as a result of that, they feel that China is uh, uh, biased in that respect. But however, having read the 12-point uh, plan, uh, I find that it's uh, a very generalized plan. It's not specific exactly, 
but it, it proposes this is the starting process, uh, seizing hostilities, for example, for any peace process to occur. Both sides must agree, for example, that killing of civilians, uh, bombarding each other, uh, must be reduced and maybe even agree to a ceasefire before proposals uh, to discuss matters. I think that is an initiative on both sides that would encourage uh, peace in one, w one way or another. And reduction of hostilities is essential, especially uh, part of the proposals are uh, against civilians. Um, China's, in fact, also criticized, uh, overtly criticized uh, the prospects of the use of nuclear weapons, for example, and what Putin did say at the beginning of the conflict and has been saying occasionally since then, that it opposes uh, the use of nuclear weapons that can escalate a conflict into a nuclear conflagration, which would be absolutely damaging to Europe and the rest of the world. And nobody really wants this. I think talk of nuclear escalation in itself uh, pushes parties to a point where they may, um, they may inadvertently uh, polarize even further. So I think because of the standards that you have in the nuclear taboo, it's important that such issues are clearly dealt with, that there is no prospect of uh, n usage of nuclear weapons, which, which is absolutely detrimental in all aspects to, to the whole global environment. Um, but there are other aspects of this peer peace plan that uh, China insists on for, for the benefit of uh, the innocent civilians that are being caught up in this war. Um, and I think my heart goes out for the, the many thousands of Ukrainians who've lost their lives, who've been injured, who've been, uh, millions of people have been uh, pushed out of the country and having s uh, sought out um, refugee status. For example, I was in Poland last year and I noticed uh, how difficult it is even for the Poles uh, who open, open their arms to, to the Ukrainians. Uh, but, but this has an effect in most countries, like it, uh, Pakistan, for example, when, when the Afghans came here and they're set here, it, it causes turmoil, social uh, fissures occur and ethnic fissures occur, which is detrimental to the society that the refugees are in. So, so you can understand that the, the countries surrounding Ukraine really want to help resolve this issue. Um, I think both parties are suffering immensely. The world is suffering immensely with the crisis in oil and gas supplies, uh, hydrocarbons, for example. And I think the world supports the prospect of having peace. Now, unfortunately, uh, the United States has uh, um, rummaged this or rubbished this, uh, the, the proposal. But it's, it's I think that's also a negotiating tactic. Um, you don't accept the first proposition that you have you provide a more succinct and concise, more targeted uh, peace plan. So the first attempt is, is always going to be vague. And then the discussion start. And as you've, you've noticed already, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, even the German foreign ministry, by the way, and uh, other parties, even uh, Ukrainian. The Ukrainians have said, maybe there's a prospect in this. If China can persuade uh, Russia in one way or another to uh, reduce hostilities, at the first instance, and then come to the table on many matters. But unfortunately, um, both sides are still polarized. Both sides are adamant in their own ways. So that's not going to happen anytime soon until further negotiations from external parties push relative parties together and consider strategic realities. And I think it's important on all sides. This is the beginning of a potential stage for a future prospect of towards peace. And I think I think the world will welcome this. Right, Mr. Anything. Basi, your take regarding this particular release of a 12-page position uh, of China regarding the Ukraine country, do you think it's the first step in the right direction? Uh, why not? I mean, this is the first proposal, a concrete proposal, though generalized, very generalized. And as they say, the devil is in the details. So that would come later. But as a first step, I think the world should welcome. And Mr. Macron, as he said, has welcomed it. And Mr. Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, has welcomed it. And he has uh, expressed a desire to meet uh, Mr. Xi, Jip Xi Jinping. I personally feel that although China has their strategic relationship with Russia, and they don't want uh, Russia to lose the war or whatever the, the is going on, they don't want it to be uh, used badly, but China is a world stage player 
It's no more an isolated power. And it wants to be seen that way. So we have seen that despite their uh, strong uh, relationship with Russia, they have not uh, voted for the resolution in General Assembly. They have abstained. And on the contrary, in the G20 conference, they didn't let the resolution go through, which was in a way condemning Russia. So we've seen in that frequent resolution, Russia and China on uh, being on one side. Right. So what does, it, uh, what does that imply? This is what I'm saying, that China is treading a very fine line. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, I mean, they are neither this way nor that way. And given their strong relationship with Russia, I think there's a greater chance of success here like yes. the West also uh, supported Mr. Erdogan, uh, Erdogan and his initiatives, whatever he took, because they, they, they understand, the world understands that a country which is more sort of uh, uh, closer to Russia can better influence, better convince Russia to sort of uh, seize the hostilities or to go for a negotiated settlement. At the moment, the question is that who runs out of patience? Because one year is a long time for, for a war in this age. Although uh, Europe has a history of very long war, even as a hundred years long war they have yes. fought. So th they have a stomach for long wars. And this is what we are saying, that a country like Ukraine, which doesn't have the too great a pop population compared to Russia, they have endured this war. They have lost lives and still they fight on. Their 18, 19, 20 years recruits we are daily emerging and go going to the war fronts. Although the, uh, so I, I don't think that Chinese proposals should be cast aside lightly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also feel that Mr. Xi Jinping uh, wants to be uh, a dominant player. The Americans have been trying to isolate Russia and they have to a large extent isolated Russia. It almost become a pariah state. And that we saw in the uh, 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 General Assembly debate that 147 countries sub, uh, supported the resolution and only seven opposed it. Mm -hmm. So you can see the divide of the world. It's not only now NATO, it's not Europe, it's the world consensus there. And the countries, uh, I mean, abstention was, China was al also abstained. So this is uh, sort of, to me, it's a mark of statesmanship that you have your friends and you have your principles and you create a fine balance between them. And, that and that so far, China seems to be maintaining that balance. So that pretty much establishes the neutrality also? Uh, uh, you look, they have not given any uh, lethal arms. Mm, they have not given weapons to Russia. They may have supported in terms of money and other resources. Their products are they providing the products which West is not giving them. That kind of support they are giving. But no uh, military hardware has yet gone into uh, Russia from China. Yeah. So these are the points which you see that they are uh, min maintaining a neutrality despite their very close relationship with Russians. So th this, this sort of, as an optimist, I see a chance of success. And what is against it is because the NATO countries led by America, they see that they seem to have an upper hand at the moment because the Russians have not made significant advantage after the initial capture of the territory which they did. For the last six months or so, they have only so uh, ceded the territory, the Kherson, etc. They, they, they vacated. So, and now with the new uh, uh, tanks, lep uh, leopard, uh, leopard tanks and other uh, systems uh, uh, which have been promised for Ukraine, the war seems to be going into another dimension. And uh, what to talk of the defensive warfare, which Ukraine was so far content with. They are talking of offensive action. So all these realities give a time uh, that the ho people should pause and think, is there something other than the war possible? And in that scenario, the Chinese proposal has a chance of success and it should be allowed to, it should be given a chance to proceed and be seen in its details. All right, uh, Mr. LaRouche, do you also see an opportunity uh, that if the things are uh, looked upon uh, with wisdom and there is a uh, slightest pause uh, and uh, the world leaders think about this and consider this Chinese proposal, given the facts that we have seen earlier 
uh, U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Anthony Blinken, warning that China was contemplating or providing lethal assistance to Russia. And now we have seen this sort of skepticism by the European allies as well. Uh, do you think after these uh, statements by the Europeans uh, and the U.S. officials, they would allow China to become a true mediator to resolve this particular conflict? Well, <clears throat> I think not if you ask uh, people like Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, or the uh, so-called foreign minister of Germany, uh, they for sure will be against it. But I think, you know, the world is a very dynamic place. And, you know, for example, the, the European Union position is that they want to not decouple from China, but... Uh, as von der Leyen is saying, uh, diversify. So all kinds of European politicians are running around Asia and, and Latin America and Africa trying to replace Chinese trade relations with other relations. You know, Scholz was in Brazil and, uh, and Scholz is now in India. And uh, I've just thought that it's very interesting because India is a country which uh, does not want to be pressured to cut its relationship with Russia because they are united through a very long uh, friendship. So uh, I just heard from a, another uh, social democratic polit politician, his name is Mützenich, um, who reflects that, you know, Scholz goes to India to convince India to join the so-called camp of democracies against the so-called autocracies. But then, you know, he is also, he can't avoid of seeing that the wind has shifted, that the global south does not want to be put into a geopolitical confrontation. And um, so I think that one can only hope that the stronger the voices of the global south are to express that they want to be a part of a, a, vo a, a force of peace and support the Chinese uh, uh, 12 point proposal and also, you have to see that in the same direction goes the uh, efforts by President Lula of Brazil, who is forming a peace group among nations of the global south. And he is going to China to meet with Xi Jinping uh, this month. And he wants to bring this, uh, this idea up to Xi Jinping. Uh, then, you know, there are other proposals, like, you know, Erdogan uh, has offered to mediate there is a new proposal by an Italian general called uh, Mini, who, who is the former head of the armed forces in, in Italy, who also has made a very elaborated proposal, which you know dovetails with the 12-point proposal by, by China. And naturally, you have the offer by, of the Pope, Pope Francis, who has offered the venue of the Vatican as a place for an unmediated uh, and unconditional uh, negotiation between Ukraine and uh, and Russia, so I think that, you know it's not either or. I think it's very much a, an organizing process, and the more the voices of peace are energetically saying we want this proposal to be accepted because we don't want to have World War Three, uh, the better it will be. Uh, the danger of the World War is very big because you know I mean if you if you think about how many incidents have happened in the past by accidental uh, flights, you know, almost uh, collisions and so forth. And the fact is that, you know, the, the, the war party, the, the people who are really intending to ruin Russia, they are saying, you know, Ukraine must win. Now, Russia is a nuclear power. As a matter of fact, it's the strongest nuclear power on the planet uh, at this point because they have hypersonic missiles which are technologically more advanced than those of, of the United States. You cannot defeat the strongest nuclear power on the planet unless you are risking to have a nuclear war followed by 10 years of a nuclear winter and then no life on the planet would be left. And the more people realize that, the world has never been in such a crisis like now. World War I and World War II were horrible but they had no thermonuclear weapons. And this time, the people who are pushing the world to the abyss of nuclear war are war criminals. Because you know you, can, you cannot risk the existence of civilization for your 
gains, whatever their motives may be, may be. And I think it's also quite interesting that if you look at some of the recent publications of China, other than this 12-point program for Ukraine, they have put out a paper called U.S. Hegemony and its Perils, which if you read it, it's quite amazing because it, 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 it has a direct language. And I think it reflects the fact that the Chinese know very well that if Russia would be defeated, then, you know, the uh, whole question of Taiwan will be, uh, you know, becoming center front, uh, more weapon sales to Taiwan. You know, there would be, a, there is a U.S. general called Minihan who said uh, the war between the United States and China will occur no later than 2025. So when Chinese uh, leadership or the PLA are listening to such a statement, they have to think that it's better for them to be on the side of Russia right now uh, you know, because the economic power of China and the military power of Russia together make a very strong team. And as uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov just uh, said, there are now two dozen applications of countries of the Global South who want to join the BRICS. Now, already right now, the BRICS have a, a GDP which is more than that of the G7. And if you add all of these other countries, you know, like powerhouses like Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and many others, you know, then the, the, the power is shifting. I think the power of the world is definitely shifting to Asia. It's shifting to the global south. And in my view, the quicker the global south countries say that they want to have a voice in where the world goes, the better. Right, uh, Mr. Arush, as you already uh, mentioned, the desire of the Brazilian president also, as well as uh, you have uh, very elaborately explained uh, uh, that uh, the power is actually shifting towards the east and the global south. Now, uh, when we talk about Ukrainian president uh, Vladimir Zelensky himself, he has also expressed the desire to have a meeting with Mr. Xi Jinping, as well as uh, French President Mr. Emmanuel Macron. He has expressed the same desire. So uh, that clearly, uh, do you think that clearly establishes uh, the leadership role of China and how concerning that should be mm. for the U.S.? Well, you know, I mean, China, from everything I know and have seen over the years, is not trying to replace the United States as a hegemonic power. Uh, they have offered a, a special relationship among great powers, which is a win-win cooperation, respect for the sovereignty of the other one, non-interference in the internal affairs, acceptance of the other social system. So, you know, I really can only say that I hope that those forces inside the United States who are not insisting that the unipolar world must remain, but those people who want to go back to the better traditions of America as it was expressed in the American Revolution, in the policies of John Quincy Adams, who had a foreign policy of having an alliance of republics. And John Quincy Adams says it's not the task of the United States to go abroad and look for monsters. Um, then Lincoln naturally was in that tradition, Franklin D. Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy. So there is a, a tradition in America of cooperation with other countries. Uh, Lincoln with Benito Juarez, for example, in, in Mexico, uh, and one can only hope that there are forces inside the United States who take up the offer of China. China uh, has said many times that, uh, you know, they want other countries, including the United States, including European countries, to cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, if you look at the problems of the world, there are so many. I mean, there's poverty, hunger, um, the pandemic can come back in another form. Uh, two billion people have no clean water. You have pe uh, countries at the verge of starvation like Syria, uh, Afghanistan, right. Yemen. You, uh, if countries would join together, these problems should be tackled. And that would then, you know, make history a better, a better place. So one can only right. hope that the forces who are for cooperation become stronger. 
Dr. Malik, your take regarding how the, uh, much U.S. should be concerned re, uh, concerned regarding the increasing leadership role of China when we see the expression of desire by uh, various presidents to meet President Xi Jinping. I think that um, since uh, United States named China as a strategic competitor, uh, there's been a high degree of polarization between the countries. We had the trade war, especially under Trump, for example. Things have dissipated a little bit in that respect. Um, but uh, but the, the fear is from the United States that uh, a global competitor, a global challenger to its own hegemony, for example, around the world is on the surface. And China wants to influence the rest of the world. There is no doubt. In fact, uh, membership in the, the World Bank uh, and uh, the seats that it had uh, were contested for many years and not allowed for China for many years until recently. And as a result, China feels that it's increasing economic power, the military power that it has, strategic power, relationships with the countries around it, that it's playing a larger part. Originally, it did not want to play a larger part, but now I think it feels that it wants to play a larger part in a global environment to influence different countries towards uh, no doubt it's on strategic interest because Americans have been doing this for their own strategic interest. And they, they nurtured the world, they created a world and world economic system after the Second World War based upon what they wanted from the Bretton Woods institutions, for example. Now, I think there's a fear that China may not apply the standards uh, that the U.S. feels that it's been applying, but I think also the U.S. has made many mistakes over the last 20 years, invasions of different countries, uh, which have all led to failure, for, for example, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, and Syria. Uh, so I think it's important for the United States to understand also that there are other countries that exist in the world that have a, uh, that have a share uh, and would like to uh, use their share of uh, global power to influence. But it's also that understanding that they, uh, because of the Western democratic system, um, we've got to appreciate also that the large, in large part, China is just one country. The global economic political system that we have is supported by many countries, many Western nations. So it, I don't understand the fear a lot of these countries have that China would overtake, because it cannot. The global political, strategic, and economic power of the West is far outweighing, for a long time to come, uh, China. And I think that fear is more aggravated now because uh, there is and there has been a certain decline in American power over the world over the last couple of decades and before that. There's a recognition that this is the case in the United States. So, so there are parties who want to maintain that global power and that's part of the global politics between the countries, the geostrategic positioning uh, to prevent China from coming out too fast whilst American is declining. And I think there's a need to grasp, but there's also this. 500 years of European, Western colonization of Asia and Africa and Latin America is coming to an end. We have to recognize that the rest of the world does exist. And as our um, and guest on, on Skype indicated, that the global south wants its part also. And uh, for better or for worse, and whatever anybody may th think about China, the fact of the matter is China was colonized. China was humiliated for 150 years. So China is party to the Global South and is a leader for the Global South as far as many other countries are concerned. And this is one of those fears that China may come to rise and take uh, a revenge, but I don't think that's going to occur. I think there's, an, there's a feeling that um, in the West that China may uh, produce reprisals, but, but I don't think that's the case primarily because um, China has achieved its success in state capitalism because it joined the global economic system. It will not want to change it drastically. There may be some maneuvering or influencing here or there for it to play a part, a larger part, which is recognized because of the population, the economic system that it has, uh, the wealth that it is, is creating around the world. In fact, it's created so much wealth for the rest of the population in the global south. With Chinese goods, mass produce at much lower cost, much of the world is now improving in many, in many different ways. So I think that's important to recognize that China has a large part to play. So does the rest of the world, the Western world. European Union is a massive block once it gets its act together.
and hopefully Britain goes back into it, <laughs> which will occur, there's no doubt in my mind. But, but I think this global competition comes to only one, one aspect in the long-term future that we have to recognize that we are only one species. And then if we destroy each other, there's nothing left. Mm. And there's so many attempts by uh, others to reconcile this. There are many initiatives on the way, and the unification of global environment is, is going to happen. And these crises allow us to understand one thing more important than anything else. One small fault by a, a nuclear weapon release or an escalation to nuclear war will destroy everything, and we nobody wants this. So Dr. Malik, I'll come to this point of uh, the threat of use of nuclear weapons also. Mr. Abbasi, has China become a magnet for the world countries uh, when it comes to its leadership role and influence? China as a century has uh, certainly come a long way, and uh, many countries recognize uh, China's leadership. And it's Inf uh, influence in the world affairs is constantly increasing mm -hmm. and at a gigantic pace, not a, uh, not a slow pace. So uh, this is what America sees a threat because America has always seen itself as the leader of the free world. And now that position is being challenged. And that's why the sh focus of America has shifted from Russia to China. And uh, he's very rightly pointed out that uh, it, it has been uh, uh, declared as the, uh, uh, the greatest opponent for the Americans. In soft words, they have coined the term. But the fact remains that the China's progress and its influence in the world affairs is increasing. And I fully agree with this point that China would not like to upend the existing system because China is the greatest beneficiary of this system. America is losing grounds and China is gaining ground. So when Xi Jinping uh, decides to enter into this fray and comes with a peace plan, I'm very sure that he's serious and he means business. Now, we have discussed everything, but we have not discussed one thing, that where are the battle lines drawn? Because if the battle lines remain where they have been drawn, then there can be no peace because if Russia thinks that uh, Ukraine should not join NATO and he should be assured of that. So uh, what is the progress on that? And if Ukraine feels supported by the Western Bloc and uh, NATO countries, that uh, the territorial integrity of every country is sacrosanct. So then uh, is Russia ready to uh, cede Crimea? and the other 25% of the uh, Ukraine, 20% of the Ukrainian territory that they have occupied. So these are the matters. So that's, that's what uh, we've seen uh, a, a kind of a version coming from the Ukrainian side also. Ukrainian Prime Minister also said that until uh, uh, the Russia doesn't go back uh, to the borders of 1991, then right. uh, but there, there is not uh, going to be any sort of a negotiation uh, even for 100 years. That's right. So uh, what, what does Xi Jinping brings? This, this is what is to be seen. Yeah. Because when you s come to negotiations, mm -hmm. you are ready to sort of modify your stance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the stances are rigid mm -hmm. because they are the declared stance and nobody wants to backtrack on that. But once somebody makes you agree on sitting on a negotiation table, mm -hmm. then you come prepared because these negotiations will be at the highest levels. The decision makers who are, the, uh, who are the actually the ones the architects of the battle lines. So they have the authority and the uh, power to modify those lines. So why, why, why do you think the, the US and its Western allies remain so much interested and adamant to include Ukraine into NATO, when there is a, a, it remains to be a clear, a clearly a red line? Uh, I personally think, think that Russia, when they attacked the uh, Ukraine, it was a mistake. Mm. It was, I would actually, in my own analysis, I think it's a strategic blunder. Because if you just uh, uh, go back and realize the situation before uh, 24th February 2022, uh, NATO was at its lowest step because they had just seen some, met some humiliation in Afghanistan. And the American leadership was seriously questioned by the European countries. And there were very vo voices, very vocal voices from UK, from France and Germany 
that the Americans led them into a disaster. So in that background, when the Russians crossed the Ukrainian border, mm -hmm. still there was some divergence of opinion amongst the Western powers. Uh, Germany did not agree to give anything more than the field hospitals and uh, that kind of support to Ukraine after the uh, Russian invasion. But as the war progressed, as the hostilities escalated, gradually all those leaders who were actually uh, opposed to it gradually fell behind the American position. Americans were always at the forefront because they saw a chance of damaging Russia while sitting secure in their borders. So this was a great opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. And they sort of made the best use of it. They have invested the most in terms of money and uh, material, uh, not the uh, human resources. Because that only Russians, that credit remains with Russia, uh, Ukrainians, it will remain with them. Right. That the blood, it's only the Ukrainian blood which has sort of changed the fate of this war. Otherwise, it was a very short war because the 35 and 40 kilometer long uh, Russian armor columns were marching towards Ukraine and the world thought that the, it's, it's only a matter of days that the Kyiv would fall and the, 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 the story will be over. Yeah. But it didn't happen that way. So uh, this, this, this was only prevented by the Ukrainian blood. They got weapons later on from the Western sources. But the initial brunt of the battle was faced by those uh, people, those Ukrainian soldiers who actually deterred those uh, frontal attacks. Right. Uh, Ms. La uh, LaRouche, how s uh, serious do you think is the threat or the use of a nuclear weapon? As we have seen, Russian president also suspending the new START treaty and has also threatened to uh, resume the nuclear testing. Well, I think that the you know danger is very big. I think we are in a more dangerous situation than at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis for the very reason that the kind of background dialogue which existed between Khrushchev and Kennedy, even during the Cuban Missile Crisis, is no longer there. And, you know, I, I can understand that Putin is saying that, you know, given what the present policies of NATO are, that he doesn't want to give them access for inspection and therefore cancelled the new START treaty. That means there is absolutely no existing this armament treaty uh, armament treaty arms control treaty anymore in place and the trust is lost completely especially after merkel and Hollande admitted that they only pretended that they supported the minsk uh, process uh, in order to give the ukrainians time to rearm uh, the trust on the side of russia to anybody in the west has been totally destroyed this is a very dangerous situation. So if you push, let's say, the red lines, they have been crossed, and it's a complete uh, mistake to think you can continuously cross red lines and never anything will happen. I think right. if the British policy uh, to encourage the Ukrainians to launch an attack on Ukraine, and you know, as the uh, you know, Rusi think tank in Great Britain has said, have a Cuban missile crisis on steroids to have a total nuclear uh, war danger and then somehow get agreement. I think this is insanity. This is complete craziness. And you know, I think what is needed instead is a new security and development architecture for the whole world. I think NATO is obsolete. NATO should have dissolved in 91 when the Warsaw Pact dissolved. And now we are in a, in a complete lawless and disorderly situation and I think what we need is a new global security and development architecture. Right. Uh, Xi Jinping has uh, proposed the GSI and GDI and I have uh, made the proposal with 10 principles which I would like people to, to study because you know this has been uh, had a big effect and you have to have a new architecture which takes into account the security interest of every single country on the planet, and that includes Russia, it includes China, it includes Iran, and many other cases. Uh, if we want to have peace, and we are the creative species, you know, the human species is supposed to be the creative species, and if we cannot give ourselves an order which allows for the continued collaboration and existence, then we mess it up completely. So I think the more quickly we can come to such a discussion 
of a new security architecture, the better. Right, Ms. Helga Zepp LaRouche, founder, chairwoman, Schiller Institute, uh, joining us on Sky from uh, Wiesbaden, Germany. Thank you very much for your time, for being with us on Wiesbaden News tonight. We really appreciate that. In the studio, we were joined by Professor Dr. Rakab Malik, associated with Center for International Peace and Stability at NAS. Thank you very much for your time also. And uh, Mr. Air Commodore, retired Basit Raza Abbasi, senior analyst. Mr. Abbasi, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on Wiesbaden News tonight. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care.